Good evening. Nice to see all of you who, especially on a beautiful day like this, uh, to come inside and hear a great discussion. Um, I'm pleased to welcome my old colleague, the former National Security Advisor, Tom Donilon, uh, to campus tonight, and, and Ann Guerin, who is uh, one of the fine, fine journalists covering um, the events of today and with deep knowledge of uh, global affairs, uh, which seems relevant on this day. Um, Tomorrow at noon, we're hosting a lunchtime program with Jake Schlesinger of the Wall Street Journal discussing the Trump administration's trade policies. On Tuesday, May 29th, CNN's Jim Schuto will interview former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper about his new book, Facts and Fears, Hard Truths from a Life in Intelligence. I suspect he'll have a few interesting things to say. And on Wednesday, May 30th, Kim Hart of Axios will be leading a conversation with tech reporters from the Washington Post and Politico about the challenges of regulating Facebook and other social media platforms. You can find out more about all of our upcoming events on our website at politics.uchicago.edu, though we're coming to the end of a quarter now, so um, there, there, there's not going to be that much to see um, right now invite you to go to the website anyway. We will have uh, audience questions uh, as always. Uh, please line up behind uh, the microphone in what aisle? aisle? In the center aisle, okay. And as usual, we'll give priority uh, for the first three questions uh, to our students. Please make sure uh, your phones are on silent. And now uh, to formally introduce our speakers is Laura Brawley. Uh, Laura is a third year from Atlanta, Georgia, majoring in public policy studies through the Institute of Politics. She's interned for, she's interned for Senator Dick Durbin's office last summer. Please join me in welcoming Laura to the podium. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Laura Brawley, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, Thomas Donnellan today. Mr. Donilon is the chairman of the uh, BlackRock Investment Institute, senior counsel at the law firm Mc o o McVaney and Myers, trustee at the Brookings Institute, and a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Donilon previously served under three presidents. He first worked in the White House in 1977 for President Jimmy Carter. He then served as Assistant Secretary of State and Chief of Staff at the State Department under the Clinton administration. And under Barack Obama, he served as the 23rd National Security Advisor from 2010 to 2013, and later chaired the Presidential Commission to Enhance National Cybersecurity in 2016. As part of his work as National Security Advisor, Mr. Donilon served as the President Served the president with his, with it, provide the president with his daily national security briefing, and worked on some of the biggest problems facing our nation in foreign policy, cybersecurity, and international energy. Fiddling for this event, Mr. Donilon appears in the 2011 photo Situation Room, taken during the Operation Neptune Spear, which led to the death of Osama bin Laden. So he's intimately equated with what it's like to work inside the Situation Room. Mr. Donilon is the recipient of numerous awards for his work, including the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the National Intelligence Distinguished Public Service Medal, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff's Joint Distinguished Civilian Service Award, and the CIA Director's Award. I'm also honored today um, to welcome to our discussion our moderator, Ms. Anne Guran. Uh, Ms. Guerin currently works in the White House as a White House correspondent for the Washington Post with a focus on foreign policy and national security issues. Previously, Ms. Guerin has covered the Hillary Clinton campaign the State De and the State Department. Before joining the Post, Ms. Guerin served as the chief diplomatic correspondent um, uh, for the Associated Press, as well as the Pentagon correspondent and an editor, a, nat a national security editor. Please join me today in welcoming Ms. Donilon and Ms. Guerin. Okay, we'll start right in. Thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you, David, wherever you are. Uh, so, Tom, I had a whole bunch of questions prepared mm -hmm. about the upcoming North Korea summit, about how <laughs> big of a challenge you would see it, what it would be like to be planning it in the Situation Room, what you thought of Trump's approach to it, and so, you know, I, I have lots of big X's in all my notes. Okay. 
Um, but I think we could have a really interesting discussion about part of that, which is when, when you first heard that Trump had said yes, uh, what did you think? And what, over the last couple of months, have you been worried about uh, as the summit looked like it was coming together and then fell apart? Yeah, thank you, man. Great to be. And um, <clears throat> I want to congratulate David and the whole team here at the Institute for what you've been able to put together the last uh, five years. Really tremendous. And um, just great to see you. It's a real honor to be here. So the summit, did I, I was on the plane today. Did I miss something? <laughs> it, it happened while I was in the cab on the way to the airport. <laughs> so a couple of things, and um, you know, one, this, is, this has been an unusual um, summit, planned summit from the beginning, and it's been a bit star-crossed from the beginning, I think. Um, one is it was agreed to pretty impulsively, and this, by, this is by the account of the administration, right? I don't think we're... Um, they're kind of speculating about this, that President Trump agreed to this upon being briefed by uh, several South Korean intelligence and foreign affairs uh, experts. Indeed, the summit was announced on the front lawn of the White House by the South Koreans, which is a very in unusual, the in the driveway, which is <laughs> yeah. a very unusual, unusual thing. So we didn't have any of the kind of um, uh, deep uh, background work that you would do leading up to a summit like this, including asking ourselves, uh, what are the goals of the summit? What can, what, what can we get out of this? Do we have appropriate understandings from both sides, right, uh, uh, to make it worth doing, right, to, to have, it, uh, be, uh, have it be poised for success, including some of the core things, like we, our goal, the United States' goal, has been is a complete and irreversible, verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The Koreans have said that they are interested in uh, denuclearization. They mean something very different, though, uh, going forward here. So I think that's the first thing, is it was, it was quite impulsive. Uh, second is that um, I don't know if there was a deep enough appreciation for the history of this pro process and this issue, as you know, and covering it for a long time. The North Koreans have made similar statements on a number of occasions, including uh, in 1992 and in 2005, and we had conversations with them in 2012. Uh, so there's a history to this, right, as mm -hmm. to what the North Koreans mean by this. Third, I think there, there was, a, it concerned me that there was a lack of message discipline around this, uh, including the calling uh, the U.S. goal, uh, to, uh, an outcome here, to be something like the Libya model. Uh, now, you know, um, uh, we, had, we had a successful effort to have Libya uh, get rid of its uh, nuclear assets or nuclear-related assets, right, uh, in 2003. Uh, they had nowhere near the program that North Korea uh, has, right? The North Korean program, by the way, we can talk about this maybe later too, is much more expansive and extensive than the Iran program, for example. So there were going to be challenges in the verification in dealing with this from the, from the, from the get-go. But the Olivia model obviously set up a lot of questions and concerns on the North, on the North Korean yeah, side. Yeah, they, they hear Libya uh, and, you know, they, see, and they hear dead dictator, yeah, right? right? Yeah, that did not, <laughs> that, that didn't, end, uh, didn't end well for, for, for Qaddafi, obviously. But, but, the, but, that was a, but that's a lack of message discipline, you know? I mean, and, and you're communicating with potential interlocutors in a summit. You're communicating with them directly, hopefully, right? But you're also communicating through your public statements. Uh, through your press statements, right? What your expectations are, what your view is of this. And I think that that was off, right? You know, unless, unless you intended not to uh, be successful. And the third thing I think that I was concerned about is that pulling out of the Iran deal before you launched in uh, to the negotiations with the North Koreans really complicated it from two perspectives. Number one, from the negotiations perspective along these lines, which is if uh, the international community says that Iran has met each of the obligations that it was signed up to under a deal, and yet you pull out, how, do, how are we going to ensure that we get the benefit of the deal we entered into? And secondly, uh, you set a standard, right? And the standard was, I mean, you know, the president has said the Iran deal was the worst deal the United States ever entered into, among others, by the way, there's a lot of uh, worst deals, right? But this was one of the worst deals that the United States ever, has ever entered into. Well, that means that you've set kind of a, uh, that you've got to do better than that in the North Korea setting, which is going to be very, very hard uh, given the challenge of North Korea. So it's been, I said, kind of, you know, kind of off from, uh, from, uh, from the get-go, really not geared for success from the, I think, from the get-go. And those were three or four of the things that, that I've been concerned about, kind of analytically. Yeah. And it turns out that Probably yeah. all of them looks like look like they they came true uh, in terms of, of being concerns, yeah. but let's let's look at it a little bit differently uh, for a moment. I mean, the, the 
the, the president is obviously has a, not only an unconventional style of international relations, but an unconventional style of communicating. Yeah. And we saw both of those on display uh, in, in the North Korea experience. And according to him and according to his, uh, his partisans, on display for good, right? He was willing to turn this sort of boring, stodgy, yeah. been through it a million times before, have nine zillion meetings uh, at a lower level process that usually precedes a summit on its head and say, all right, this guy and I can understand one another. We have a circle of mutual interest. We, let's see if we can make a deal within that circle. I'm, I'm willing to throw that whole model out the window. Is there any value yeah. to, to that? Just sort of, look, let's take a flyer on this one and, and, and do it differently. Well, I, wouldn't th I, mean, I don't know the president should take a flyer, right, you know, <laughs> with respect to these kinds of things. But, no, but there was, you know, the movement towards direct negotiation for the North Koreans was a positive thing. The North Korea situation was going to be a challenge that Hillary Clinton would have faced if she had become president of the United States and Donald Trump faced when he became president of the United States. All the dimensions of this problem were going in a negative direction. Uh, they, they, were, uh, they had a bigger program. They were demonstrating the ability to deliver uh, 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 missiles mm -hmm. or deliver nuclear weapons uh, uh, under, over a long distance, including perhaps to the continental uh, United States. They were showing advances in technology. So if you were doing a kind of a stoplight chart and the arrows could be up or down, it was all negative. Before. So getting to a posture where there was a possibility of, of a negotiation, um, I think was a positive thing. Uh, but then you've got to gear it for success, right? So he, you can make the bold move, right? You know, but you should, you should, you've got to gear it for, gear it for success. And knowing the history, having clarity in your goals, having discipline, including message discipline, because we've seen this, we discussed it the first question, right? That it's kind of this, this is this messaging that the, it's the public dialogue that has mm -hmm. kind of thrown it off, off, uh, off kilter here, right? Including, we found out today in Secretary Pompeo's testimony, there was also, there seems to be a breakdown in private communications too uh, between the, the, uh, the United States and North Korea. But you do need to, there are, there are lessons to be learned here, right? And, um, and you can make the bold step, but then you've got to, I think, kind of make sure that you can, that you can, that you can succeed. My own view would have been that, um, uh, I wouldn't have uh, pulled the uh, kind of pulled the plug on the entire thing or, or canceled the summit, as President terminated, Trump said. Right? It terminated the summit, yeah. right? I think the right thing to do would have been to say we've got we're on track to have a discussion. You've had two meetings with Secretary Pompeo. That seems to be a decent channel. We're not. It doesn't feel right at this point. We seem to have uh, fundamental disagreements. Why don't we Why don't we postpone this summit on June twelfth and have Secretary Pompeo come to? Uh, go there or meet a third party, a third country, and work on this more. That I think would have been a better. So why do you think he thing. didn't do it? Do that. I don't he think. Seems to have just that, gotten mad and dictated. Well, some of that is, you know. But I think this kind of the bold stroke. I mean, seems to be the. But the other problem with this is, of course, is that it. Um, it's a. To, it's opposed to the alternative that I just laid out, which is basically saying we're not on track here. Let's do some work to see if mm -hmm. we can get it on track, and you have a decent channel with the, uh, with the Secretary Mike Pompeo. Why don't we use that channel? Um, you know that that it's it's a um, there was a there was just a better there was a better way there was a better way forward here, and the consequence of it is of course is that to the world even though as Secretary Pompeo testified today maybe the North Koreans have shut off conversations with us it looks to the world like we walked away, and that's the way the North Koreans will play this right that they were interested in moving forward so I think that was a, if we we posture ourselves kind of in a. Uh, and, and not, a, not in an advantageous way. We also, obviously, I don't think we briefed our allies before we did it. So surprising, you know, the South Koreans who have more at stake here, uh, as much stake as, any, as anybody here, uh, I think was a, it was just a set of, of, of um, statecraft, I think, mm -hmm. errors which could have been, which could have been uh, prevented, I think. There was a fairly remarkable quote from the South Korean president, Moon Jae-in, today, uh, who had been get, getting a lot of credit here for sort of uh, playing Trump to his advantage, you know, kind of this this whole denuclearization, but project, but really the the North South yeah. discussion project was uh, the the central tenet of of Moon's campaign and successful uh, uh, campaign for the presidency, and he kind of brought Trump along on on part of that project. Yeah. So to apparently the White House didn't even call Moon directly no. before 
they issued this letter Dr. today. Dr. Grant's had a National yeah. Security Council meeting yeah. at midnight after it was uh, uh, after it was released. But here's another statecraft Can you issue. No, not really. But here's a statecraft <laughs> issue, right? Uh, <laughs> I can imagine a lot of things. You know, I've lived, as David knows, I've lived in very dark places for a long time, right? I can imagine, I can imagine a lot of things, right? But they, uh, uh, and they're not even figments of my imagination, right? So, um, you know, but they, there was a, um, you know, so you did, I think the Allies obviously were, will, be, will be surprised by this. But here's another statecraft thing. Um, you should never, ever rely on the representations from a third party about something this important that you don't check out yourself. Why is that? Not because people want to mislead you, you know, uh, or want to keep you off track. It's just that everybody has their own perception, right? Everybody has their own interest. Everybody has their own spin on things, right? You know, and so it's absolutely critical uh, if you get a briefing like the president did uh, uh, a couple of months ago, right from the South Koreans saying, we've met with Kim Jong-un, we think he's prepared to have a summit, and we think he's prepared to talk seriously about denuclearization, you have to go check that out. Yep. You know, you, you have to do it directly. You have to look them in the eye, right, and say, you know, is this what you mean? And they did, you know, Director Pompeo did, did, did some of that, yep. but, but uh, not before the president announced that he was... Uh, that he was prepared to go uh, prepared to go ahead here on this. We didn't have kind of these direct kind of understandings, and there's time to do that. But I, I, again, I would have done it differently. I would have put the thing on hold and said, right. "We have to do some more, and some more had, work here." Had the election worked out the other way, you were um, co-chairing Hillary Clinton's uh, national security uh, transition. Uh, a lot of people thought you were going to be Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have been in a decision, but potentially could have been in a decision-making position there. It, I, I'm interested in, I know this is all sort of, you know, the mists of time, but knowing the way Hillary Clinton approached uh, world problems, and frankly, since she was present for, yeah. for, for some of this, I mean, she was in the White House as First Lady, the first time the North Koreans sold the nuclear carpet uh, to Bill Clinton, and she was in the Senate the yeah. second time they sold yeah. the nuclear carpet, uh, and, and watched all this develop. Uh, I heard her speak a number of times about her deep skepticism that the North Koreans could ever be persuaded yeah. to, to fully give up their nuclear weapons. How do you think this moment might have been different? I mean, she would have been presented on day one with the same yeah. set of very, very uh, deep and, and uh, looming problems uh, with the North Koreans, a fully developed nuclear program you alluded to earlier. Uh, ballistic missile uh, program that was on the on the cusp of uh, having ICBM capability, which they've since demonstrated, uh, and a clear desire to confront the United States with the above. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I said, bo both Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump are going to be confronted with this problem. Indeed, as we know from reports, right? I think you guys have reported that uh, President Obama, during the course of the transition, said to President-elect Trump. The most difficult and important issue you're going to need to address is going to be the North Korean nuclear in program. In the car on the way to the Capitol. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so it was a, you know, it was going to be a, a problem to be addressed for whoever got elected president. And indeed, as we said, the, yeah. the, the, the outgoing president of the United States said to the incoming president of the United States, this is going to be your number one challenge going, uh, going forward, number one. Number two is uh, you know, Hillary Clinton did have a lot of experience with the North Koreans and, uh, and I think a healthy amount of skepticism with respect to their willingness, ability, intention to keep their promises. Um, number three, though, I think that the approach of the United States probably would have been in the first instance the same, right, which would be maximum pressure campaign. Right. I think that's the probably, UN. yeah, right. Mm -hmm. This is where this was, this was, mm -hmm. where this was going was gonna to go. And it's the, it was the right strategy. Essentially, uh, the reference point would be the Iran strategy. Oversaw our pressure campaign for five years uh, on Iran. And we basically, we, we brought the goal of our effort was to, was to uh, have a, a, a level of sanctions pressure that was regime threatening. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we undertook for a period of a uh, number of years, six years, right, with respect to Iran, and it brought them to the table. So I think that we, the United States would have pursued a similar program. The, the, the question is, when, did, when were we going to move to a negotiation? Now, what was going on here, though? There's a lot of, um, and people say, well, it was, the, it was the pressure campaign, it was this, it was that. It was a number of things going on here, including this. Uh, people kind of glossed over this, but last November, Kim Jong-un announced that the North Korean government had achieved its goals. 
that it had a deterrent, that it had a working uh, national nuclear uh, capability, mm -hmm. and that it now could move to economic issues uh, and perhaps move towards negotiation. So there are a lot of dynamics, uh, dynamics underway here that would have been underway in a Clinton administration uh, as well. I do think that uh, you know it, it, it was, it's a mistake not to not to check this, not not to get some clarity on your prospects of success. I think she would have had a lot of those boring pre-meetings. Well, right? we did, you know. I mean, and the uh, you know, and the Iran deal, as you know, Anne, you know, uh, this this was a multi-year effort, yeah. right? You know, it began uh, under the Bush administration. It did, you know, mm -hmm. and a multi-year pressure effort, and then a multi-year diplomatic effort, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, we, you know, and I saw over saw a lot of stuff where we, you know, you wanted to know. Uh, exactly who was representing whom, right, and what the conditions were going to be, and ultimately it was a successful negotiation. This negotiation, by the way, you know, one possible scenario that people were looking at was that President Trump would have met with Kim Jong Un on June 12th, and Singapore had a declaration of principles of some sort announced, and then there was going to follow a very long and hard negotiation, including a lot of technical stuff. Mm -hmm. North Korea is vast in terms of the, the mountainous uh, nature of it. Um, you know, the, your, your colleagues who went up to witness the destruction of the nuclear testing site were treated to an 11 hour train ride, a one hour bus ride, and then a one hour hike, right? Mm -hmm. You know? So and they got uh, like blasted with nuclear dust. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, right. that, that, I'm glad so, I wasn't on that trip. <laughs> so it was a much more difficult verification and monitoring effort than in the Iran case, for example. Right, right. I mean, the, the, the relative failure of the uh, Syria um, chemical weapons uh, uh, pact and, and agreement yeah. comes to mind, right? Yeah. Syria is a small country. It's a relatively small country yeah. uh, and, and one that's very well understood yeah. by the United States and its neighbors and by Russia, which was, was supposed to be overseeing that yeah. effort. And clearly, there was some stuff yeah. left over, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> These difficult yeah. problems that would have been yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, and the, the, the we had the, the United States also had to build out a very large team. I think over a hundred people to do the Iran negotiations mm -hmm. because of the technical aspects, the expertise that was re, that right. was required. How do you monitor a nuclear program? Right? You know, what kinds of testing regime do you, do you need there? You know, how do you report the information? What's who going to be the validators? It's a complicated, complicated uh, piece of business. Let's move to Iran, then we can come back to North Korea in the Q&A if, if any of you all are, are interested mm -hmm. in more there. But Tom, you have called uh, the U.S. withdrawal from, from the JCPOA or the, the Iran deal uh, the worst mistake the United States has made in the Middle East uh, since the Iraq War. Yeah. Can, can you explain that a little bit? And as someone who, as you uh, mentioned a moment ago, uh, was there for a lot of the groundwork uh, to, to make that deal. Uh, what do you think has been lost, and is any of it uh, recoverable? Yeah. So the deal, it's important, I think, to, to talk about what the deal is and what it isn't. Right. Um, you know, um, its critics say, well, uh, Iran is still engaged in malign activities. It's still a source of terrorism around the world. It's still a source of instability uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it's still proceeding with its ballistic missile program. All those things are true. Um, the purpose of this deal was to address the nuclear program. We had a specific security problem that we addressed, and it was, a, it was an arms control agreement. Uh, it basically kind of it stopped and rolled back uh, and prohibited some, uh, uh, key activities for a long, time, long period of time related to the nuclear program. It was, an arm, it was a classic arms control agreement. It was never intended to be a transformational agreement. You know, as we were discussing earlier, you know, when Henry Kissinger was doing arms control agreement with this, agreements with the Soviet Union, uh, there wasn't any expectation that the arms control agreement to reduce the number of weapons we had aimed at each other, right, or we're going to build, we're going to change the nature of the Soviet Union, right? It was, a, it was to make us more secure, open up additional channels for, for conversations, right, and to solve a specific problem. That's what we did here, and it was successful. Mm -hmm. uh, on its own terms, even the uh, President Trump, Secretary of State, the UN body that oversees uh, the deal uh, and the international uh, uh, parties to the deal all say the following, that Iran has met its obligations under the deal, right? And in fact, for the next decade and a half or two decades, these, um, it's likely that these restraints would remain in place uh, uh, going forward. So the deal itself was, was successful on the arms control side. Now, so uh, why would you throw that out 
in order to address these other things when your alternative could have been hold Iran to its current obligations, which have been successful. We were on the road, as you know, and for, um, uh, to either having Iran get a nuclear weapon or a military action. That was the choice that we were coming to when we did this deal, and we were able to roll the, roll the program back, right? Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon, unlike uh, North Korea. Uh, and then we can go forward and address these other problems. And I think the other key to the Iran deal was it was multilateral. So the pressure, we talked about the pressure that we put on Iran. The United States itself couldn't put any pressure on Iran economically. Right? We, didn't, we hadn't done any economic, we didn't have economic relations with Iran since 1979, uh, when, the, when, the, our hostage, when our embassy was overrun and we cut, off, we cut off relations in November of 1979. So we had to pull together the rest of the world in order to have it be a successful mm -hmm. sanctions campaign. And we did that here, right? And so you had that in place, and the right, the right way to go would have been to keep that in place and then say, now we're going to work on follow-on agreements that, that concern us. And the way to be successful on that is to have all of Europe, the Russians, the Chinese, and others continue to work with us on pressuring Iran to solve these problems. I think we had a chance to, uh, had a chance to do that. The other thing here, and I'll finish up on this, I think a cost of this thing in pulling out like this has been really serious problems with, the, with our European uh, allies. Yeah, uh, I want to ask you yeah. what advice you have for yeah. European allies in just a second. Yeah. But to go back onto the, the, the deal itself, um, I mean, it must have been clear. I know you were, were gone from the White House when the, the ink was actually mm -hmm. signed, but uh, you, you were there for, for, for all the formation. I mean, it must have been clear that you were taking a risk, right, in not addressing ballistic missile development, yeah. in, in allowing, I mean, the key risk, right, was allowing some uh, uranium enrichment, uh, a, a risk that not only Congress wasn't going to like the deal, and they yeah. didn't, uh, but that a future U.S. president wouldn't like to do. Yeah, well, the key, well, it, these, these, there are always a balance of risk in these things, mm -hmm. right? You know, and then, of course, we had to balance risk here. And we also did it in the form of, a, of an executive agreement as opposed to a piece of legislation or a treaty. The judgment was made that, we, that that was the way to go because we probably wouldn't have gotten uh, uh, the, uh, the, the approval otherwise, and it was an important thing to move, for, to move forward on. So it was vulnerable to... Um, it was vulnerable to being overturned by a, by a, by a successor. Mm -hmm. I don't think in that the risk was to continuing the, you know, some de minimis uh, production of some uh, uh, uranium, right? I think that there were risks around the, uh, the sunset clauses and things like this. That there, right. were, there, were, there were trade offs and risks that, uh, risks that, uh, that you, had, you had to manage. Uh, uh, but it was a decision made that this would be focused narrowly, not broadly, right? It would be focused on the nuclear program itself and that the other issues that have to would be addressed moving forward. And those were the choices that were, that were made. And I think, uh, I think the record is that, it was, it, that it's been successful uh, on its own, uh, that it's on its own terms. Uh, and we don't have a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. We have not had another war in the Middle East. We haven't had military action. And the Romanians, at least as best as we can tell, haven't made any progress in the nuclear program. Yeah, well, they haven't had to. Yeah. <laughs> sort of shelved it. Yeah. Um, so on the Europeans, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, they obviously saw this coming. Uh, a number there was a, a, an effort over a number of weeks and months yeah. to try to, to salvage some part of the agreement uh, and, and get the president to agree yeah. to a, a kind of a, a, a side deal, a, a supplemental deal that would carry his Im imprimatur and, and that he uh, it might allow them to uh, save themselves from secondary U.S. sanctions. Yeah. Obviously, that all didn't did yeah. not work. Yeah. Where are the European countries uh, who have worked quite hard at this point to, to maintain and, re and repair their uh, uh, relations uh, and trade arrangements with the United States? Where, where, where are they left now? And, and do you actually think that the Trump Treasury Department would go after uh, Total or yeah. uh, Mercedes Benz well, or who knows what um, for doing business with yeah, with Iran. That's what they. That's what the Treasury Department and the lead and the Secretary of Treasury has said. Uh, it certainly and, dangled yeah, it as right, a pretty yeah. pretty big threat. And number but. two, the uh, the chairman and, and CEO of Total, which is a very large European mm -hmm. energy company, which one of the biggest investors in Iran after the deal was put in, has said that uh, it's likely that these investments are going to have to be 
uh, yeah. sacrificed, right, going, uh, going forward. So I do, think it's a, I do think it's a serious problem for the Europeans. You know, we were pretty, it's interesting. I guess at some level you shouldn't be surprised that President Trump pulled out of the deal. He said he in the said campaign he was going, he was going to, to pull out of the right. deal, right, you yeah. know. Uh, he signed the waivers to stay in the deal several times, really grumpily. I think, mm -hmm. is that fair? <laughs> he was pretty grumpy about it and was public <laughs> were, about it. There was more than grumpiness, right, right, yeah. yeah. He did not, did, did not yeah. want to keep signing the waivers. He didn't want to stay in the deal. So in some ways it's not, a, as you said, it's not a, it's not a surprise that he, that he did. Most of his advisors were for staying in the deal, I think, mm -hmm. uh, including the Secretary of Defense. It was said that he thought the deal was in the U.S. interest. You had a change in national security advisors and secretaries of state leading up mm -hmm. to this. Although, uh, the, we had negotiations underway by a guy named Brian Hook at the State Department, who's a policy planning director and an excellent diplomat. And, you know, my understanding is, is that we were 80 percent there. Uh, and indeed, press reports, I don't have any way to verify this, but where the Secretary Pompeo wanted another two weeks, right, to see if we could actually come to it. But the president kind of cut it off. Uh, again, I think to kind of, it's personal, it's the campaign promises, it's his predecessor's deal. And so I think we actually had a path towards doing these add-on deals if we were 80% we were of the way, 80% of the way there when he, when he cut it off. Now, the Europeans, this is a more general issue, I think. Um, we have a really serious set of uh, fissures developing with Europe. Mm -hmm. This is one where uh, we have the, you know, a, a specter here of European companies who have done who do business in Iran. By the way, because the deal was done, Iran's not violating the deal, and they went in and, and, uh, and, and did uh, economic deals with Iran, uh, now being told that if they continue that, they're going to be subject to penalty by the United States. Uh, the United States is the center of the world financial system, and if the United States says to a bank, if you do business with Iran, you can't do business in dollars or with the United States, that's not a close call. Yeah. That's just the way that, 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 that is one of the great privileges that the United States has as the world's reserve currency and as the economic center of the world, to be able to say, if you want to, you know, you can either deal with us or deal with them. Uh, and that was the power, that was the power of the sanctions that we did, uh, with those secondary sanctions. So we have, I think, a real fissure developing here. And, and, and the, the, the pushback is going to be, there wasn't a violation of the, uh, of the deal. Why are we being penalized? At the same time, by the way, we're having a discussion with the Chinese about letting yes. ZTE, a major Chinese <laughs> communications company, off yeah. the hook for violating right. Iran and North Korean sanctions. So it's a very tough conversation, I think, with the Europeans. And you've also had other things. We had uh, the Paris Accord, right, where we pulled back, mm -hmm. and the Europeans obviously were quite, uh, quite committed to. We have a set of separate sanctions that we put on the Europeans for steel and aluminum that we won't, right. give, them a, we won't give them a waiver uh, uh, to. Or uh, Japan. Or, or Japan, right, mm -hmm. saying that somehow that it affects our national security mm -hmm. adversely. So there's a, we have a, a, and we've had a lot of, a very, we have a president who's very critical of NATO. So we have, I think, a real divide, and it's gone unremarked, I think. Um, we have a real divide developing between the United States and Europe, I think, on a, on a whole range of things, including some values issues, I think, yeah. and mainly around democracy. Well, and, uh, you've and the said, Russian interference and things like this. It's you've really seen Merkel, uh, Angela Merkel in Germany, and, and, and others uh, make statements about, you know, well, we're just going to have to uh, do this on our own, yeah. and, and we'll have a different kind of relationship yeah. with the United States the, going forward. Exactly. Before, the world won't stay static either, right? right? They'll right. move, you know? So, so in, what do we see now? We see the Europeans uh, uh, in, going to Russia, right? Just to, working with the Russians to try to save the North Korea deal, which we, the United States, negotiated. So that's an unremarked, I don't think it's gotten enough attention, is the kind of the, mm -hmm. the growing gulf between the United States and Europe. I really worry about it. And also, it, there's really no reason for it. You know, that's another whole, what, what is the, what's the strategic fundamental reason? You know, we had disagreements with the Europeans over the years, including on nuclear issues during the Reagan administration, right? Mm -hmm. But there were policy disputes, right? There were disputes in terms of outlook. This is, this doesn't feel, have the same kind of weight to it that, that uh, and we've got a big impact around it. Mm -hmm. That was one of the kind of larger themes uh, of the world I wanted to address. And before we go to questions, um, let, let's just hit a, uh, one or two of, of the others. Um, quickly, uh, uh, China, obviously, gigantic topic. Um, hard to ask you to do it in a minute. But you write a lot about China. You consult about China. Uh, do you think that the United States and China are inevitably in uh, in in conflict or mm -hmm. on a path uh, to, toward conflict. What does China want for itself yeah. 
uh, and how does that affect the I think United it's the States? Most important strategic issue the United States faces in the 20, 21st century, um, which is this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, dynamic where you have an existing power, the dominant power of the United States, and you have a rising power, China, challenging it in a number of areas. And the question presented is, how do you manage that going forward? Now, you know, uh, Graham Allison, whom you know of the, up at Harvard University, is, has uh, you know, published a book arguing, uh, talking about something called the, the Thucydides trap, right? I said to him his greatest accomplishment would be to get people to be able to pronounce the name of his theory, right? You know, but, the, uh, <laughs> but which essentially is this dynamic uh, of, um, of rising and existing powers, and he looks at 16 case studies since 1500 and says that in all but four of those cases led to war. Now, mm -hmm. it's hard to compare exactly these circumstances over you know, the, the hundreds and hundreds of years. But nonetheless, you know, and I think the dynamic is right. You know, to, to worry about you know, kind of as the, you know, how, we gonna, how, how are we gonna manage our relations uh, when China's in, a, in a kind of a much different, uh, much different posture. And it's coming to the fore in economics right now. Um, and what this latest kind of back and forth is about, you know, the president's been focused on the bilateral trade deficit. So he wants the Chinese to buy more American things, okay. That's, you know, you can address that, but that's one piece of it. That's not the core issue. Yeah. The core issue is our structural issues about what the rules of the road are, you know, particularly on technologies. What can you do with your companies, right? You know, how, can you subsidize them, right? What, what are uh, appropriate intellectual property protections? That's the real game, I think, going forward is this, is this, uh, is this, is this technology area. And we're in a, we're in a, don't you think, in a much more competitive phase with China than we've, we've been. And this is generally the case, I think, in the world. We're entering into a world of, you know, we had 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall where great power relations were generally constructive and productive. Uh, and we're in a different phase. Now, China and Russia are not the same. Russia we're actively hostile with, I think. And China, we're in a more competitive phase, particularly right now on economics. So it is the central management challenge for US foreign policy going forward. And I wish we were having that discussion strategically as opposed to, you know, discussions about, you know, dollars and cents on the bilateral trade deficit. ZTE. If you yeah. want to ask a question, some, you can start making your way to the microphone. Um, so I confess to being more than a little confused about what our trade policy is with mm -hmm. China, uh, as the ZTE being the, the latest example. But on a larger frame, do you, how much do you think trade explains the world? Well, it explains a lot of it. Uh, I, um, it has certainly, you know, uh, the liberal trading order the United States put in place after World War II uh, has had a lot of major impacts, right? It's mm -hmm. had spectacularly positive impacts around the world, moving you know, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, providing U.S. citizens with much cheaper goods, but it's also had negative effects. Yeah. Uh, and this is part of the, the governing crisis in the Western democracies, which is a failure, I think, to really understand these fast-paced dynamics that include globalization and trade, right? Yeah. It also includes, by the way, demographics and immigration, um, and, it, you know, uh, and it includes technology. Right. Uh, so these things have all kind of come at the same time to put pressure on the Western democracies. But a, but a part of it has been um, a policy failure to deal effectively enough with some of the negative impacts of, uh, of trade. Um, so it explains a lot, but it's not the whole, it's not the whole game, right? You know, I mean, our, you know we, we had in the Obama administration, under President Obama's leadership, you know, something called our rebalance to Asia or our pivot to Asia. <laughs> and it had, uh, it had multiple elements to it. There were military elements to it, there were diplomatic elements to it, and there was economic elements to it, including trade. And our approach was different. Our approach was this Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement we, we did with 12 countries that were gonna set rules of the road, and I think ultimately gonna have China, uh, China has to move to those rules. We pulled back on that. And this is another example of how the world doesn't stand still. The United States pulled out, the other 11 countries went ahead. Right. Uh, so, Trade, trade explains a lot, not everything. Uh, and I think increasingly, I'll finish on this, increasingly with respect to pressure on uh, the Western democracies and uh, you know, certainly obviously com large forced communities in these Western democracies, technology I think is gonna be uh, equal or much greater uh, source of pressure. Don't yeah. you think? I think that's the, I think we, you know, trade, there were lots of impacts in trade in the 2000s, but technology right now in all its aspects, I think has a, has a this is a, um, an equally big challenge for us. 
Well, I had a whole bunch more, but let's, I don't want to eat up uh, uh, any more of the time for questions, especially from students. So um, let's, let's do that. I, do you, uh, if you can come to the microphone and uh, ask uh, your, go ahead, ask your questions. <laughs> thanks. Uh, Wolfertsburg, I'm a second year student. I've been whisked to the frontier because I'm a student. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, given that if the stated goal is to, uh, on or on, is to prevent them from getting a bomb, yeah. and for all that you've said tonight, it seems that pulling out of the deal is just like singularly the worst possible way to accomplish that. It's been speculated by some, for example, Stephen Walt, colleague of John Mearsheimer here, that the real reason, or the only possible explanation behind it is to effectuate regime change in Iran. Yeah. And that's backed up by certain uh, statements and sentiments of Mr. Bolton in the past. So do you think that's too dire uh, an analysis, or do you think there's any truth to that? I think a couple of things. You know, well, we'll get, we'll get back to Mersheimer in a second. I want to talk about it. But, but the, um, I think that, you know, there were the, the number of people in the uh, Trump administration have had strong views on Iran, including Ambassador Bolton, um, who has been, I think it's fair to say, a regime change advocate for, uh, for a long time. Uh, but that's not, the stated, that's not the stated policy of the Trump, uh, Trump administration. You know, they have a you know, they have a set of goals that they, that they laid out that they're trying to achieve in terms of Iranian, Iranian behavior. But you're absolutely right. Uh, if the principal goal is to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, a constraint that's working, uh, it would seem to be that one, you, know, that you should um, keep that constraint and then work on the additional problems. So I can't, you know, I don't want to ascribe motivations to people I haven't talked to about it, but you, know, you have past positions from a number of folks there who look for who have looked to uh, regime change. I think that, in fact, we could address a lot of these problems through, uh, through agreements, and we actually did on the, uh, uh, on the, um, uh, the, the, the Iranian nuclear program. It's interesting you mentioned you know, Mersheimer, John Mersheimer, so. I don't take his class, just as a, huh? that's it's not, not a plug. It's not a plug, okay, all right. <laughs> I, won't, I won't help you out anymore. Then. But, no, the, the, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we talk about this competitive phase, Anne, that we kind of entered into with China. It's more than geopolitical, too. We, we have, we're entered into an ideological competition in the world as well, um, where, uh, you know, I think it was assumed that as, for example, China got richer, it would move to kind of a Western liberal order, right? Uh, and uh, would take on a lot of the attributes and a lot of the kind of the way that we approach things in the, uh, in the West and in the United States, and that's not what's happening. Uh, they've chosen a different path, a unique path, and they have a separate alternative on offer to the world, and their argument is that we think we can deliver better than you can deliver uh, people. And this is an important argument for us to be in going forward. You know, there was a famous, there have been three famous books, right, after the Cold War. One was Frank Fukuyama's book, The End of History, where he said that the Western liberalism had won, that it was over, right? That's, that has turned out to be not true. The other was Sam Huntington wrote this famous book, Clash of Civilizations. Well, we'll see, there's been some of that. But John Mersheimer wrote this book called The Tragedy of Great Powers, which, which seems to have explained a lot of things moving forward. It's a little too, it's a little too mechanical for me, uh, but it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a lot of important observations in that book. That's a rare endorsement from a liberal who comes to talk at the IP. Right, yeah, right. I, I, said there were some in, I said there were some important insights in that book. Right? <laughs> Please. Hi. Uh, so it's interesting to look back on this ZTE issue. Yeah. It started as a FCC issue or Iran nuclear, uh, Iran sanction issue, but it turns out that both sides, the United States and Chinese government, framed it into a trade issue. And the outcome is in China, we see a higher level of nationalism because of this issue and also a more, a more openness on the side of China because China is going to buy more uh, U.S. goods. And on the United States side, it's more like Trump is trading favors with China, so he would not, not get, you know, he, he would actually uh, have his agricultural base to be lifted of this threat from China. So what do you think of this, um, this uh, back and forth? What kind of impact it it has, yeah. and, and is that just uh, run of the mill trading favors, you know, moving pieces, and framing yeah. issues in a different way, or it has any any sort of strategic uh, value? Yeah. Well, in every trade negotiation, is a search for leverage, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and obviously the uh, you know, the uh, ZT's ability to buy. 
uh, certain essential components from the United States turns out to have a lot of leverage, in, a lot of leverage in it, right? And I, I read a report today that ZTE's already lost two billion dollars uh, as a result of not being able to buy the chips from the from the United States. That's, a, that's the first point. So there's, there's always a search for leverage in the, in the trade negotiations, but but this is a different. The ZTE thing is is a is different in kind, uh, and I think it's I think it's important to treat it that way. ZTE is a serial sanctions buster. Right, you know, and it was it was Iranian sanctions and North Korea sanctions. 280 instances of deep violations into North Korea as well, and they paid a billion dollar fine, and then they had this remedial period, and they didn't do what they were supposed to do during the remedial period. Right, you know, so it's been a they are that's an enforcement action. I think it's important for the United States to enforce its sanctions of regime. So I am. I don't. I don't think it's it, it, it's right to kind of mix them in. Frankly, the way that it's been that it's been mixed in. I think it should have been treated as an enforcement, as an enforcement action. But it's obviously there's a there's a there's, it's a search for leverage, and it's had a big impact in China, um, as um, you know, as you were alluding to. I think one of the impacts it's had in China, of course, is to really reinforce the Chinese drive to develop indigenous um, uh, indigenous technologies, right, um, and not be as uh, and they said this, not to, not to be as rely, rely as much on outside, on outside technology. But I do think, I think it probably would make more sense to have to separate it out because, in fact, it's not a normal, it's not part of the trade issue, right? It is a, it's a sanctions enforcement issue. These, these guys were serial sanctions busters and they were, you know, they paid, I said, a billion dollar fine and they were, and they still didn't, uh, they still didn't conform the behavior to the law. So if you're going to do business in the United States, you have to follow U.S. law. Um, just got a note I wanted to, to ask you about. I don't know the full context of this, but um, uh, my newspaper is uh, reporting just now that North Korean Vice Minister Kim Ga Kwan uh, has been quoted saying that North Korea is actually ready to come back and talk to the United States mm -hmm. at any time. Uh, mm -hmm. Have we seen this movie before? Yeah. Well, this is what we talked about, Anne, right? Basically, that you know, the, the United States looks like the person who's kind of walking away and doesn't want to, you know, and is uh, and is kind of uh, you know, kind of um, uh, walked away from the walked away from the talks, and the North Koreans see the advantage, right? Saying, no, well, you know, uh, we're willing to talk. We don't know, you know, we don't know why the United States has been so uh, has been so um, um, reacted so sharply on this, which is why I think the right recommendation would have been. We don't have the right understandings. Let's postpone June 12th. We have said, by the way, President Trump said publicly June 12th might or might not work, right? It's not going to work, but let's have the Pompeo channel opened up to see if we can make some progress. So this yeah. is, these are the North Koreans trying to get uh, some leverage and advantage. Hi. If it's true, but is that a reliable newspaper? You know, <laughs> <laughs> democracy dies in darkness. <laughs> I actually kind of wish we hadn't gone with that one, but it sort of sounds like a, a bad Darth Vader movie, but um, the sentiment is strong. Right, it is strong, yeah. Hi. Hi, thank you for being here. I'm Tenny. I'm a second year political science major, um, and I have another question about China. Um, so earlier you talked about how the liberal trade order that the United States established after World War II had really immense impacts and listed many people out of poverty. Um, and, and part of that, especially in um, East Asia, was kind of connecting the economic recovery of Japan to a lot of Southeast Asian countries, countries opening up a lot of export-led um, economies in that area. And China wasn't really part of that because of the turmoil and eventual rise of the CCP in China. So China wasn't really uh, a key factor in the economic recovery mm -hmm. of Japan in general, yeah. Great Crescent. Um, opening up of East Asia. And I was just wondering, as China has risen to be a major economic power, how China can fit into that original model potentially, or if that model would need to be changed in the future? Well, China had its own opening up, right? You know, beginning in 1979, um, and, you know, made a, a and, and then aided uh, in its opening up in the early 2000s by U.S. supported accession to the WTO. Um, and uh, so I think it's a, it's become a. It's become a. a you know, obviously, a, um, the most one of the most important economic forces in East, in, in East Asia and, and globally. And indeed, if you look at the trade numbers, right, um, the number of countries now in Asia 
uh, for whom China is their largest trading partner, has gone like this, right? You know, so it knitted itself together, I think, economically, uh, with uh, with the, with the rest of the Asian, with the rest of the Asian economies, uh, you know, pretty uh, you know, pretty direct. Now the question is, um, uh, and I think it's the central question right now is is ha has China done that following the rules? Um, in other words, have they been able to take advantage of the openness uh, and the access they've gotten to other economies? by opening up their economies? Well, I think the evidence is no. Uh, and it's a real, I think that's the structural issue I was talking about that I think that has to be addressed in addition to the, um, in addition to the, the trade balance issue, which I think is, the bilateral trade deficit is not about kind of trade deals. It has, it's a more complicated investment and saving set, uh, set, set of issues, right? And it's not gonna, it doesn't solve the long-term problem. So I think that China has become its, uh, its um, kind of own model, right? In, uh, uh, in, in Asia, initially kind of export-led growth, classic Asia, um, uh, Asia thing. And it, what it did take a big set of decisions in the late 1970s uh, to, to go with a different model and to, and to open it up. And now we're on to the next phase. It's interesting, as Xi Jinping um, portrays himself as the next great figure in Chinese history, you know, that Mao kind of brought the country together, um, Deng Xiaoping opened it up and made it rich, and now Xi Jinping is going to make it a world power. Yeah, That's like Xi Jinping thought has been added yeah. to the Constitution. Yeah, exactly. His term limits have been you know, yeah. deleted. So. Yeah, the extraordinary things underway. The last thing I'll say about, about your question is this, though, because you mentioned the Communist Party. Um, here's the bet that the, that the Chinese are making. Um, and I said they have an alternative model. Their bet is this, is that a centrally controlled, one-party system can become rich. And their goal is to try to become rich, a rich country. Their goal not, is, is set out by their 100th anniversary, the People's Republic of China, which is 2049. That is, that's, that is the bet, right? We've never seen anybody under, try to undertake anything like this in world history. Uh, they have all kinds of challenges, including demographic challenges. But, uh, and, and some of the concerns, I think, that people are trying to think about is that the Communist Party is becoming more deeply involved in the economy. This is really one of the big themes of Xi Jinping's uh, tenure, which is to bring the, the party more centrally into everything in Chinese life, including economics. And the question presented is, is that, is that, is that a mistake, right? Uh, and can they pull off you know, one of the great experiments in world history? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alejandro. I'm staff here at the university. Uh, so my question is related to uh, North Korea's nuclear program. Uh, so after years of negotiations and different measures that the U.S. have yeah. taken to deal with this issue, now they have a robust nuclear program, yeah. so much that you, you're saying that it's even more powerful than, than the one that, uh, that Iran has right now. So don't you think that a new approach was needed after so much effort was put in place by the U.S. and like different countries in the world? And, mm -hmm. and even after that, uh, those measures, they even got that nuclear program. So what, what kind of things could have been done uh, differently yeah. uh, to stop that? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I mean, point one is that the North Korean program is, is exceedingly more advanced than the Iran program. Iran never developed, it doesn't have a nuclear weapon. And North Korea, at least according to press reports um, in the Washington Post and elsewhere, has a significant number. Um, of, uh, of, 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 so it's a much more complicated program. The second is that I think that the right policy was the policy that the, that the Trump administration extended and intensified, which was the maximum pressure policy to try to bring them to the table. Um, I think a mistake is having all or nothing positions. That, uh, you know, that, that uh, getting at least maybe in the first instance to an arms control agreement on freezing and capping the program and then having denuclearization talks going forward, you know, is a decent, I think, is a decent uh, approach. Um, I do think there, was, there were some historic mistakes made, though. Uh, and this hasn't gotten discussed very much, and it's kind of a controversial uh, issue with my friends in the, uh, in the Bush 43 administration. Um, so in 1994, the United States entered into a successful agreement with the North Koreans to freeze their nuclear program and to dismantle it, the so-called agreed framework. Uh, and it did. Um, it did freeze and, and so, so the dismantlement of the plutonium-based program that the, that the North Koreans had. And it stood in place for almost a decade, until 2003 or so. What happened in 2002, 2003 is that the administration discovered that the North Koreans were cheating and had a parallel program, right? Uh, and so the decision was made by the United States to pull out 
of the program altogether and unleash essentially the North Koreans. I didn't, I didn't, didn't have any obligations at that point. This was kind of a hostility again to kind of arms control agreements and thinking it has to be all or nothing, as opposed to saying, we're going to hold your feet to the fire on meeting your obligations under the agreement that we've had for nine years, and now we're going to do additional agreements to address the new program, the secret program that we have found. Um, and I think, that would have, I think that was a historical mistake, frankly. Uh, and, we, and, you know, uh, and I think that you know, after that uh, point, the North Koreans were kind of off and running with the program. Indeed, within 24 months of that, being named the axis of evil and things like that, they, did the, they began nuclear tests. To continue on this theme, okay. uh, suppose for a moment that the United States offers a deal to go from regime threatening, blockade, sanctions, yeah. to uh, admitting North Korea into the WTO yeah. in return for a kind of uh, reform and opening up, but also uh, really taking the South Africa model, not the JCPOA, that that would be such a huge benefit to North Korea that they should give up even being a threshold nuclear state. But my real question is, suppose such a deal uh, is on the table, what would guarantee, well, this would really be regime change from above, uh, led yeah. by Kim Jong-un, uh, to bring about a kind of more Chinese-type regime, which would be a huge improvement. Yeah. But what would be the guarantee to Kim Jong-un, and also what would be the long-term effect in the rivalry between the United States and China to have a kind of little China regime in North Korea. Yeah, the question presented is whether or not uh, Kim Jong Un would want to enter into kind of stealth regime, kind of regime change on his own motion. You know, I mean, a, kind of a dramatic opening up like that would be very threatening to the to his to his uh, you know family's rule there. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know that they would go for a, kind of a dramatic opening up like that. I think that they're looking for. They're looking for sanctions relief and kind of incremental economic economic uh, yeah, relief going I, forward I, here. I find that I find it hard to to imagine that it, in any in any relatively near term that Kim would be bargaining away uh, the main thing he has, which is the family dynasty. I mean, yeah. this is a guy who's paranoid to leave his own country because he's afraid of a coup, right? Yeah. It's, <laughs> Yeah. He's only left twice since he came into office in 2011. Right. Now, there's some rumors he might be in Beijing right now. I saw it in some reports earlier. I don't know if that's true or not, but he's only left the country twice since December of 2011, and both times to China. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Ann, for being here. <clears throat> um, my name's Steve Wolf. I'm a Booth alum. I work as a CFO, and I'm also a proud alum uh, in international relations from Memory University. Mm -hmm. My question is about... Um, specifically about Russia, but it's about uh, cyber <clears throat> and appro appropriate responses to uh, cyber attacks. And then perhaps more broadly, Tom, on you know, your overall opinion of <clears throat> you know, the released national security strategy yeah. of, of the United States. So what do we know about, uh, about cyber warfare? Uh, well, we know that um, it uh, terrorizes, um, it kills. Uh, we just saw um, how Facebook was used to incite violence and, and cause deaths in Sri Lanka. Uh, we certainly know that um, uh, the attacks on the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, electrical grid in the Ukraine could have caused deaths and certainly terrorized people. Um, and we also know that um, under three existing statutes, the Secretary of State has the power to, uh, to designate uh, states as uh, state sponsors of uh, terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you think about the idea of, uh, of designating Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism? Or, or perhaps creating a new list, uh, which is called uh, uh, state sponsors of, uh, of cyber uh, terrorism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so last year we saw more cyber attacks, as, as you know, on um, private sector entities than we have in history. Um, second is that I think that that you know, kind of the source volume and sophistication of attacks is increasing. Uh, and we see that I think, for example, one thing we need to be, on, I think, very attuned to is as we pressure Iran in the way that was described by Secretary Pompeo last Monday, I think you can see that cyber as one of the asymmetrical ways in which they respond. Mm -hmm. um, third, the Russian, um, in the Russian cyber campaign or cyber ca capabilities are, are varied and vast. We obviously saw the, uh, the um, 
interference in the 2016 election, but that was a subset of, inter of information war generally, but there's a cyber element to it. But there's also been reports in the New York Times and elsewhere of Russia, Russians actually gaining access to the control mechanisms yes. in, in critical infrastructure in the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. Cyber will become part of any war fighting effort, I think, uh, going forward um, among, among, among nations. So it's a, uh, it's a, a kind of a clear and present danger would be the first point. Mm -hmm. The second is, so the president gave an 80-minute State of the Union address earlier this year, and he That's never said the word cybersecurity. Uh, which was really surprising to me. In 80 minutes, you can get a lot in, right? So, uh, so uh, and I, you know, so, but he never, he never mentioned it. Uh, it was not a, it was not a topic. And indeed, two weeks ago, uh, my successor, Ambassador Bolton, announced he was eliminating the position of cyber coordinator in the National Security Council. So I don't know why all this is. Maybe some of it's bureaucratic. Some of it may be that in fact that. Um, the folks who are kind of running running these operations now haven't been in in a long time and are not as familiar with uh, with some of these uh, you know with some Do of these. Do they need you back? Uh, I'm sorry. Do they need you back now? Well, you know, I did a report, right? I did a, okay. I did a report and we delivered it to the Trump administration in January 2017. So the uh, uh, I don't expect to be invited into, into this uh, in this administration anytime soon. But uh, now your point on the, the question, direct question. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, attribution is always a, is a is a really difficult problem in cyber, um, but I some I am a big believer in public attribution, as part of our deterrent here. So, I'd give it some consideration, frankly. Yeah, yeah. So Hi. you're the last question. Hi. <laughs> Great. So uh, my name is Joachim. Kim. I'm a grad student in the physics department. So uh, we got a physics but, guy here tonight. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so I wanted to get back to the issue of well, nuclear weapons. So yeah. in the last year at University of Chicago, we commemorated the first self-sustaining nuclear reaction, the Chicago Pi-1. Mm -hmm. And uh, so sort of like big picture, we talk a lot about the nuclearization of North Korea. So, but I wanted to zoom out a little bit. So I realized that this is not something in the short term, uh, given the state of world affairs, but how would you see strategically long-term in a smart way? First of all, first question, what's the future of uh, U.S. nuclear arsenal in terms of modernization, and then maybe the thing I wanted to get to, long-term strategy for denuclearization overall, like the, two, the elephant in the room being the arsenals of the U.S. and, and Russia in particular, yeah, like yeah. how we can move towards long-term denuclearization globally, not just, you know, in terms of North Korea. Yeah. So it, it, is a, it is a really hard problem if the United States and Russia aren't working together on it uh, as the two, the, two, uh, the two largest arsenals. You know, we did a New START agreement in the first Obama term uh, to reduce the, uh, the number of weapons down to a historically low level. Um, but if the United States and Russia aren't talking about these things, it really is kind of a barrier to kind of moving forward uh, in, the, in the kind of way with, that, I, that I would like to see is kind of the first point. Second, on, on modernization, we have expensive and important modernization programs um, that I think you know, we'll have, are well-funded and will go, we'll go forward. But the third thing I wanted to say is this. So um, I do worry that, um, uh, that the new administration is, um, is moving in a direction that's different from every administration since uh, John Kennedy. And that is this, that it's been the express goal of every administration. I mean, I, this was not the Eisenhower administration's view, but it was from Kennedy on. It's been the express view to reduce the reliance on nuclear weapons as part of your strategy, right? Uh, and I think we're seeing a different direction right now. I think we're seeing an interest in actually increasing reliance on nuclear weapons and increasing the kinds of roles that they play. I think that's not really not the way to go. The United States needs to stay. I don't think it's necessary from a strategic perspective or from a defensive perspective, but that's the direction I feel that we're going in right now. And essentially, um, it has underneath it a, um, a serious, I think, conceptual, again, kind of conceptual change. And that change is basically seeing no difference between so-called low-yield nuclear weapons and conventional weapons. And that taboo, right, again, really since the really since the 1960s has been something we've been very, con very conscious of, right? Uh, that they are different in kind, right? You know? um, and that that distinction is important to maintain if we're going to maintain the kind of leadership going forward. We have a bit of a, an amnesia problem, I think, on nuclear weapons in the United States. Uh, 
that we haven't really, you know, don't have kind of the kind of the, it's, it's historical, right, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think there needs to be a lot more focus on these conceptual issues. Um, uh, should we stay focused on less use, right, less reliance? Uh, shouldn't we stay focused on continuing what Thomas Schelling called this taboo, right, uh, between the use of nuclear weapons uh, and conventional weapons? We've had our folks at the Defense Department testify in the last few weeks um, that on various uh, scenarios for use of nuclear weapons, again, kind of as, as a substitute for a conventional, conventional response. I think that's a mistake uh, going, going forward. So I think there are some conceptual, conceptual issues that need to be kind of uh, grappled with uh, moving, moving forward. Um, and then I think in the last, I'll say, in the next phase of our relationship with Russia, uh, you know, right now, as I said, it's actively hostile. Um, I, you know, and I'm, you know, I have, you know, I've spent as much time with Putin as most of the people who work in the, in the U.S., uh, in the U.S. government right now. Um, he's taking Russia in a different, I think, in hostile direction for the United States. But at some point, we'll have to get to a modus vivendi, right? And I think the nuclear discussion should be at the top of that. Well, Tom, thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you, Laura. But David's gone. Thank you, Jake. I really appreciated uh, uh, the questions. And Tom, I thought I, I appreciated your candor. And, and uh, thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.